No, you're not seeing things, but this is as close as most of us ever get to a real RS200. And today on Kits and Cruising, I shall nobly force myself to drive this machine and tell you what it's like. I hope you appreciate the sacrifices I make for you. But first of all, a potted history of Ford's almost rally star. The RS200 was Ford's belated entry into the Group B arena, earning its name from the 200 cars Ford needed to build to comply with the rules. By the time Ford's baby was getting close to competitive, however, Audi, Peugeot and Lancia had already been slugging it out for a couple of years, and a couple of fatal accidents spelled the end for Group B rally cars. The story didn't end there though. The manufacturer was left with 200 cars, or thereabouts, after rallying had destroyed a few. And Ford's answer to that little problem was to stick in a bit of carpet and make a road-going supercar. Hurrah! Installing carpets and luxury seats as a gesture towards comfort, the road cars were still pretty raw. Performance saw sub 6 second 0 to 60 times, and most were geared for 150 miles per hour. All with full-time four-wheel drive. Even today, little touches them, and this excellent replica from RS Automotive will fool many people into thinking that you're one of the lucky, very few owners. There are differences here though. It's longer, it's wider, and it's lower as well, and that's all aimed at making more interior room available. And look at this. This door started life as a moulding taken from a three-door Sierra, modified to fit. And before you tut at such a blatant shortcut, let's remember, shall we, that that's exactly what Ford did with the original. Open that door, take a look inside, and we're confronted with the dashboard from a Sierra. Well, yes, but then so are real RS200 owners. You can start to see what I'm getting at, can't you? Of course, you're now going to turn around and say, but surely you can't fit the original running gear, can you? Well, no, that would be slightly costly. But if you're going to use the dashboard from a Sierra, you might as well use some of the other bits. So underneath me, we have the steering and suspension from the old stager. Oh, and behind me, we have a Cosworth unit tuned to 360 brake horsepower mated to a Renault transaxle. So it should go some, then. There's something quite comforting about sitting behind a familiar dashboard taken from an old Sierra, and at first, yeah, you feel quite relaxed and calm and in control and dawdling around at low revs. It's a very easy car to drive. But as soon as the uh, turbo comes on at certain revs, things become a little bit trickier. And all of a sudden you become aware this is no shopping car. It's a very serious piece of kit and a very well sorted piece of kit. It feels solid, the suspension feels just right, the ride is purposeful. This is a car you really could learn to drive quite hard. Now, we haven't been able to drive an original, authentic RS200 next to this to make comparisons, but we are prepared to stick our necks out and say that this is probably a lot more refined than the rally-bred original. That's not to say it isn't fast, though. It is, incredibly. But for normal, everyday use, it's probably a far more practical proposition. It's not just in the details that the focus stands out from the crowd, not just in the strikingly styled headlamp or the rather oddly styled rear windows or even the triangular side repeater. It's the whole car. And it was undeniably quite a bold move on the part of Ford to introduce something so striking to replace its ubiquitous Escort. And all a very far cry, you might think, from the original Escort when it first arrived on the scene decades ago. At first, it was good, very good. The Mark I Escort was light, durable, rugged, and with those Coca-Cola bottle good looks, really very attractive. It was also reasonably priced and subsequently very, very popular. Then came the Mark II, a little more boxy, perhaps a little more modern, but probably not as good looking, and it didn't meet with an immediately positive response. 
Then came Mark III, another change, and gradually, through the next marks and generations, the Escort was watered down until the disastrous Mark IV. Probably the only thing that could keep this car selling was the little blue oval on the radiator grille and the confidence that that instilled in the car buyer. And so they gave us this, the Focus, with its unique form that integrates straight lines and curves, pretty much unlike anything else on the road before it. Now those looks may be a bit love it or hate it, but whether you do love it or hate it, there is no denying that the Ford Focus is a very good car, for a lot of reasons. For a start, there's the interior where that mix of curves and straight lines has been carried through and we get this dashboard, which is... Well, striking again. To me, it looks rather as though somebody has taken all the required parts, the dials, the vents, the switches, and thrown them violently at the dash, and they've exploded out from behind the steering wheel. Fortunately, though, they've all landed in pretty much the right places, and everything comes to hand as and when you need it. And the plastics used seem to be of pretty decent quality. It doesn't feel like budget, low-rent, cheap car by any means. My only complaint, well, for a modern car in an era when we're supposed to be light and bright, it does feel rather gloomy in here. And then there's the drive, which is very good, and that's thanks largely to the multi-link rear suspension. It has the equivalent of giving it independent rear suspension. And the reason that's good is it means the suspension itself can get on with doing what it's supposed to do, which is keep the tyres in contact with the road for as long as possible, simply because each wheel is independent and doesn't interfere with the next if it's bumped or jolted. The result is a great drive. It feels extremely predictable, very much planted on the road. And that drive is helped again by the driving position, which is, again, very, very good. Even the size of the wheel, it feels grippable and malleable and about the right sort of dimension. And in the right place, there's enough visibility from here. I'm comfortable, I'm in control and on top of the car. As a place to be, it's not at all bad. There's the usual amount of hatchback type space. If you need a bit more and of a different kind, well, there is a saloon version that's being made, though whether or not you can forgive its, shall we say, quirky looks, is up for debate. If you need more space than that, then there is an estate version, a proper load lugger, which again is probably not as interesting to look at as the hatch, maybe a bit more traditionally styled. In common with a lot of manufacturers, Ford were hoping to exploit the platform of their medium hatch contender by making even another version, this time a small MPV. Unfortunately, they got caught up in the debate as to whether to have five or seven seats, and we've ended up with, well, none, because they haven't made it at all. We won't see that for another few years. As for engines, well, if you're after a thumping great V8 job, you're buying the wrong kind of car. If you want something that does the job, it's economical and ranges from a good frugal diesel to the really quite sporty ZTEC, then you're in the right kind of place. Of course, as soon as you come to a nice twisty A road, you can start to enjoy that clever rear suspension. If you've got one of the ZTEC engines, the whole thing feels real quite surprisingly sporty. OK, so it was pretty brave of Ford to replace that most bog-standard of cars, the Escort, with something as radical as the Focus. Whether or not, though, the Focus will go on to see as many generations and incarnations as the Escort remains to be seen. Will there be another Focus? Watch this space. In the meantime, well, I think I'll stick to my Escort replacements, driven the same way as the original ones, by the wheels at the back, if you see what I mean. Actually, I don't know about get in on the act. They pretty much started the whole thing with legends like their XR2 and XR3. And now they're hoping that their Focus ST170 will recapture those glory days of old and once again bring sporting motoring to you and I, the masses. Well, they're not off to the best of starts, because whereas the XR2 and XR3 were in their day to look at Larry, this is a bit sensible, really. But still, let's not judge a book by its cover.
It generates 170 brake horsepower. The clue is in the name ST170, and it does that from a 2-litre Ford Duratec engine. Don't go thinking, though, that 170 brake means it leaps away scrabbling at the tarmac like a mad thing, because it doesn't. It's more sort of progressive power. It is rapid, but that's about it. Mad quick, uh, no. What does stand out particularly is the steering, and it's not something usually I'd bother praising, but it is so fluid, so quick reacting, so easy to use, so predictable and so communicative when you're pressing on. It really is superb. If the Ford Focus ST170 takes your fancy, you'll enjoy the 170 brake horsepower, bringing a top speed of 134 miles an hour within reach. 0 to 60 is done in 7.9 seconds. It is a 2 litre 16 valve engine, and again, that six speed gearbox. Insurance Group kind of splits the difference at 15. The way the whole car is set up, if you were to get this car onto a track, you start to remember just why the Ford Focus is praised for handling so well. If you really press on around the bends, as you apex, if you lift off the accelerator, you'll get glorious lift-off oversteer, so the tail will come out and step round nicely, impressing your friends, because you are then lacking a little bit in power to straighten the whole thing out at the other side, so be a little bit careful and one for the track, definitely. Now, I don't know if hot hatch drivers are getting more sensible, but if this is anything to go by, then they are. It's the kind of hot hatch you wouldn't be afraid to take home to your mum, and that's not what we want at all. There could be a good reason for this, though, because Ford, probably at the end of this year, have their viciously fast Focus RS coming out, and maybe they didn't want to steal its thunder with this, the ST170. Either way, if you haven't seen yet the hot hatch of your dreams, here's a rundown of our further five alternatives. I know, I know, it is basically a Rover 25 in a gangster suit, but somehow it does the business. It's a sharp performer, the ride is hard but not harsh, there is a fair bit of road noise and the interior ain't fooling anyone, pure Rover 25. It comes fifth here simply because we wonder if it'll ever really overcome the pork pie hat and box of tissues velcroed to the parcel shelf image of its forebears. As the VW Golf GTI has travelled its path through countless incarnations, it's transformed from fiery, youthful inventor of the hot hatch phenomenon to, frankly, rather overweight 30-something. It's best now at all the least interesting things like security and practicality. The 1.8 GTI does manage at least to feel slightly sprightly, and what you can't knock is the VW build quality and reliability. It comes forth. The Audi S3 Quattro may be towards the entry level of the Audi range in terms of size, but not in performance. It oozes quality from every pore and has plenty of power, and the added advantage of Audi's legendary Quattro four-wheel drive. It may manage 0 to 60 in 6.6 .6 seconds, but it's really not an out-and-out -out driver's machine, and it is a bit steep at 25 grand. In second place, the Peugeot 206 GTI. Good looking, spacious and quick too. It's grown bigger and fatter with age and lost that rawness that made the 205 GTI a defining hot hatch. At 13 and a half grand though, it's not overpriced and it must be good at something because it makes it to second. In first place though, a car to feature in a thousand teenage fantasies, the Renault Clio 172 Sport. If Dad had one of these, you'd have to cosh him to get the keys. It's as close as you can get to a modern day take on the original hot hatches. It looks great, the interior is cool, and it goes, well, like a really, really fast car. In an age... I know, I am pontificating, but bear with me, it won't take long. In an age such as this, where cars are forever crossing boundaries, 
where off-roaders go on-road, where estate cars go like rockets and mini-family MPVs have turbos fitted. There are still a very few cars that stick to a plain and simple formula, and they don't get much plainer and simpler than this, the Ford Mondeo. A four-door, four-seater saloon with a wheel in each corner and one inside for you to hang on to. So does it stand a chance in an age like this? plain and simple. There's a heck of a lot past of the Mondeo. In many ways it has to blur more boundaries than many other cars. Weekdays, well it's got to be happy to plough up and down the motorway containing mummy or daddy, selling computers or toasters or whatever they do in the week. So it's got to be frugal, comfortable, efficient. Then weekends it's got to accommodate the kids, the dog, go to the swimming pool and do all of the family stuff. So it's got to be an MPV. But the story's a little bit more complicated than that, because just because we've settled down, had kids, grown a bit older, doesn't mean we're entirely boring and past it. Honest, it doesn't. We still aspire to, you know, look reasonable. A car still has to make a statement about us. We still have to pull up outside the pub to see our mates or round at friends' houses or wherever, so you don't want to look too much of a burke. In other words, the Mondeo has to do everything for everybody. It is a car for every day of the week, weekends and evenings as well. That's a lot. So whilst other fancier vehicles get on with combining their abilities as a long jumper and an Olympic swimmer or whatever else they do, does the Mondeo quietly get on with being pretty much everything to everyone? Well, going through them one by one. Come weekdays, it's got to be frugal on the motorway. Well, it can be, because you can choose from a huge range of engines, from the mighty V6 petrol Duratec, which is lovely, to this that I've got today, the Dura Torque diesel, which is excellent, very strong, very frugal, very economical. Also, when we're feeling business-like, it's quite a business-like cabin in here. It's fairly sombre and dark and sensible, but you want that. There's a few touches of brushed chrome here and there that lift it a bit. It's perhaps not as substantial and smart feeling as a BMW or a Mercedes, but it isn't a BMW or a Mercedes. It's a Ford Mondeo and it doesn't do badly. When it comes to playing at being a family bus at the weekend, well, accommodation isn't bad at all. There's a huge amount of space, actually. And there's a lot to be said for that good old-fashioned, sensible four-door, four-seater saloon layout. Everybody's got their own bit of space. You're not overwhelmed by too much or too little headroom. There's an enormous and secure boot as well, so it'll do fine. One problem, if you've got a dog, of course, it is a saloon. You can't put a dog rack and have a thing in the back, and you wouldn't want to put it in the boot. But then there is an estate option which would solve that for you. And then there's that final, rather hard to define category, the one that gives us the opportunity to slip the leash every now and again and still feel good about ourselves. Well, the Mondeo has been highly acclaimed for its handling and performance, and justifiably so. It's a very neat handling car. It's not exactly the thrill of a lifetime, but come on, it's got a lot of jobs to do. And in the look stakes, you're not going to stand out from the crowd. Your mates are not going to go, wow, new Mondeo, eh? Nice. How'd you get that past the wire? But it looks smart. It does look distinctive-ish from some angles, kind of. This is its natural environment. An ordinary car park on a rather ordinary day. It's not a car born to exciting times trekking the Amazon or posing around Monte Carlo. What it does do, though, is a great many things for a great many people, which is in itself kind of exciting. And underneath, there lurks a very competent driving machine, and it does prove that a very old-fashioned formula, a four-door, four-seater saloon, can still be interesting, even if it is very much on the quiet. It seems like only a couple of days ago that diesel engines were only ever dropped into huge cars that covered thousands of miles a week. And yet here we are with the launch of the dinky new Ford Fiesta and the diesel engine version is the best of the range. I'm not kidding. Of the two petrol engine versions, the 1.4 runs out of puff when you try and pass anything faster than a bus and even the 1.6 feels wimpy. 
By comparison, the 1.4-litre diesel feels smooth and powerful, pulling away from much lower revs and making the small car feel much bigger. It's not exactly a rocket, though. 60 miles an hour takes a rather tedious 14.9 seconds to arrive, and it's all over when you get to 101 mph. It is frugal, though. Ford claims 65.7 mpg combined, which is not bad. Ford have worked hard to help the Fiesta grow up a bit without sacrificing the driving fun that it's always offered. It still feels agile and fast with a firm and controlled ride, perhaps a little too much so around town when it can get a bit jarring and bumpy. I know it's only a small car, but it's still got to have enough room to be useful. The previous Fiesta was always a tad pokey, and so Ford have made sure that this new one gives plenty of space, both for front and rear seat passengers and boot space. The Fiesta's another 1.4 litre, and we're down now to 67 brake horsepower, which isn't very good at all. It's slightly quicker than the C3 off the mark at 14.9 seconds, though, but you will pay a little more for your insurance. It's an enormous and terrifying Group 4. Ooh. Small car, of course, no longer means badly equipped. Even the base models get twin airbags, a CD player and central locking. Move up the range and you can add electric windows, aircon, alloys and special sporty interiors. There's no way could Ford afford to launch the new Fiesta with anything other than a competitive price tag. The range starts at 8,495 quid and the diesel version weighs in at a reasonable 9,495 pounds. Faced with fierce competition from its small car rivals, Ford have decided it's time to freshen up the Fiesta and give it, well, a slightly new look for the Millennium, but without taking away the basic characteristics of the car. Now, with the new kids on the block, the likes of the Toyota Yaris, the Fiat Punto, which is already outselling the Fiesta in parts of Europe, and the Renault Clio, Ford have given the Fiesta its house style. Yes, it gets new edge design styling. If you're mystified as to why the new Fiesta didn't get the 1.7 engine instead of the 1.6 engine, well, it's because Ford didn't want the Fiesta treading on the toes of the Puma. You see, the 1.4 Puma has 88 brake horsepower, the 1.7 125, and this new S engine kind of fits nicely in the middle with 103 brake horsepower. It does 0 to 60 in just over 10 seconds at a top speed of 113 miles an hour. Revisions inside the Fiesta are, quite frankly, very minor. In fact, looking at this now, you can see very little difference from the outgoing model. But it does look a bit better, and it's very well put together and very well built with a look of the Puma inside, but just doesn't have the je ne sais quoi and the style of the Renault Clio interior. There's also the option of head and chest side airbags, which is apparently a first for a car of this size. One thing it doesn't have, which is very annoying, is a switch inside the car to open the boot. You always have to use the key, and that really gets on your nerves. At the front end of the car, well, as you can see, it's been given Ford's new edge design headlights. It gets a new bonnet, new wings, and new bumpers. It's almost like the Fiesta's gone into a hairdresser's and asked for a new edge design perm, and it's gone slightly wrong. And at the back, well, again, very little has changed. It gets this cheap fuel flap, which looks like it's gonna fall off, an extra spoiler, and it seems to have grown some bulby bits, which look like a pair of breasts at some angles. I thought new edge design was all about sharp, angly points. That certainly isn't. 
The new Fiesta lineup now consists of the 1.25 and 1.4 ZTEC engines, plus the base 1.3 Endura E and 1.8 litre diesel. You can choose from five trim levels Encore, Finesse, ZTEC, LX, and Gear, plus the new S. Now, if you're in the market for a small car, well, there are lots to choose from. They're all very different but all very competent. So have Ford hit the right note with the new Fiesta? Well, it's more a revamp than anything else in response to the likes of the new Clio and the new Fiat Punto. The Fiesta has always been a very entertaining car to drive and still is. It's probably the best of the bunch for that, despite having any real potent engines in the range apart from the new 1.6 ZTEC S. I think you'll either love or hate the new Fiesta. I personally like it. Or you'll take so long to make up your mind over whether you like the car that you'll buy something completely different. This week we're going to look at one of the most popular light commercials on the market. Now these particular vans have been around for a long time. Let's go and see what new security features are fitted on these vans, shall we? So, what is this new van? It's the new Ford Transit. Now, this new van's got a lot of new security features on it. Let's have a look at the one. If you notice on the back, not a door lock to be seen. It's all remote, and you have this remote to lock it with and unlock it. So if you lose it, you're really in trouble. Make sure you keep that safe. Right, so the styling of the new Transit, it's certainly got a lot better styling than the old one. If you look at the outside of it, it's certainly a lot more pleasing. Interior cab, it's much more comfortable. So now we know this is the new Transit. Does it drive as good as the new Transit? The old Transit was good. Is this better? Let's try it, shall we? Right, the new Ford Transit. Now this is the new shape Transit. This is just a low roof one. They do a 75 and 100 BSI one. Now this is the 100, it's known as the 280S. Nice torquey, new 2.5 diesel engine, a lot of torque in that. Good fuel consumption at all on these new ones. They reckon round about 34 to 35 MPG, which certainly isn't bad. And with these new ones, they've got these great big front windows. Instead of them silly little quarter lights, that were really new, not use nor ornament really. The only thing you don't get on here is a tilting steering column, which could be a bit of an advantage if you're a long-legged person. All the controls are easy, no big long stalks on these, not like the old Transit that had the twin stalks, but if he wasn't careful, you put the wipers on instead of putting the indicators on. Surprisingly for a van as well, it's not that noisy. There's not a lot of drumming noise through from the back. We don't have a bulkhead fitted in this one, as in some but the noise is certainly not drowning you out. Handling is very precise. Again, you'd expect it to be from transits, wouldn't you? Been around for a few years, they should have got it right by now. Good suspension on them, nice and solid, even though it's empty. It doesn't sway about all over the place. It is a nice, safe ride. Right, one of the things this transit's got is this new bonnet catch. Now, this is a new security feature on here, but if this isn't well maintained, that is going to cause a lot of problems. Now, this new Duro Torque engine, very flexible, a lot of torque, good fuel consumption, but there's been a few technical glitches on the electronic side, so just make sure that you do get one with a three-year warranty on, just make sure that everything's spot bob on with the electronics on it. Right, the technical spec on these new transits, you can get two engines on these, a 75 PSI and the 100 PSI. So, depends on whether you're doing motorway work or around town, you can get the vehicle that's going to suit your requirements best. They're comparable on fuel and the servicing intervals, 10,000 miles. You've got to remember also, being Fords, that spares are readily available. We've road tested the new transit, we've looked around the new transit. It's got a lot of new security features on this. Minor two minor glitches as well, which you've got to look out for. Styling, it's certainly a lot better looking than the old Transit, a much better vehicle. It's got a good torquey engine on it. Is it the van you buy though? So, we're here. We have to be careful here and here. And with a bit of luck, we should make it through here and end up here. To recap, 
This then is our house. That's the end of our road. We turn right past the roundabout where the shops are. There's the school. Drop the kids off. We should make it back. Mission accomplished. So obviously, we're going to need a 4 before. Well, that's what everybody else uses to tackle the urban commute, isn't it? And our chosen steed is this, the all-new Ford Maverick. Whilst the previous Maverick was nothing more than a spot of badge engineering on a Nissan Tirano, this new one is just that, all new, and it's made entirely from Ford jeans. It's a competitor in the lightweight SUV sports utility vehicle market. In other words, a competitor for the likes of the RAV4, the CRV, and Ford's arch enemy, the Vauxhall Frontera. Every time a new 4x4 is launched, whoever makes it, the manufacturer will say, oh, it drives just like a car. Well, it doesn't. They never do. It's a 4x4. It's tall. It's got longer suspension. It's got huge unsprung weight with the extra transmission. But, in the case of the Maverick, it's not far off. It's not at all bad. Big wobbly monster, it isn't. The most direct comparison is going to be with the Vauxhall Frontera. Mm, you can feel it shudder when I mention it. So they've got to answer to the impressive Frontera V6, and they have with this 3-litre V6. It's basically a bored out and enlarged version of the 2.5-litre Duratec familiar to Mondeo owners. There is a 2-litre option as well. This one will dash from 0 to 60 in about 10 and a half seconds and onto a top speed of 118. Not much, but it's actually quite respectable for a car in this sector. Checking out a new car that claims to be good both on and off-road and only driving it on the road would be a bit like having a Swiss Army penknife and only using the blade and not the scissors. So we've got to have a go. We just need a bit of mud. All right, so it's hardly crossing the Andes, but this is about as rough as it's likely to get for one of these cars. Maybe romping across a field to find the best picnic spot. So this is probably a fair enough test. It's hardly a mud plugger's dream, but it's got the basics to get you out of trouble. Ordinarily on the road, the drive is delivered to the front wheels. But if you are getting off-road and you detect a bit of slippage, power will be transferred to the rear. Alternately, you can do it yourself manually by switching to permanent 4x4. As soon as you get off-road, things like rather vague steering no longer matter. There are a couple of problems, though. The throttle on this particular one is incredibly sensitive, so it wouldn't be too difficult to get into a bit of a kangarooing situation. It does suffer, though, from something I've noticed in one or two SUVs recently. They claim to be off-road capable-ish, and yet they've got absolutely no steering lock, which is useless if you want to change direction in a, a nasty, cramped bit of woodland or maybe at the top of a bendy, twisty track. Not a good point in an off-roader. The very fact that this car is compromised means it's never going to be a star or anything, but if you want something that can romp across a field happily and get you to that best picnic spot before anybody else without the wheels falling off, yeah, it'll do the job. Of course, when you do finally pull up at the perfect picnic spot, the last thing you want to do as you stretch out in your blanket is look across at a real moose of a car. And Ford haven't done a bad job here. It's not the most striking of cars, but it's not ugly either. There is something spookily freelanderish about the front end, though, and along the flanks. Odd, really, that they should copy a car made by a company that they also own. When you get to the rear, there's something slightly Jeep Cherokee-ish about it. A large part of an SUV's job is to be a fashion statement. It's got to look like it could take Davy Crockett hunting caribou in Alaska, but all you're actually going to do is cruise the high street. Despite what the manufacturers might say, these things are not really about romping down to the lake with your jet skis on the back and your mountain bikes on the roof. They're about going to the shops, dropping the kids off at school. Day-to-day, -day, ordinary, boring stuff that somehow a car with this extra space around you makes that a bit easier and a bit more pleasurable. And that's what it's about. It's boring, but it's true. If you fancy one, you won't have to be a millionaire to buy one because for the 2 litre you'll pay about 17 grand and for the 3 litre you'll pay about 20 grand. They may not be the most exciting vehicle on the road, but whether you're going on or off road, they'll do the job. Ah, what a day! And it can't help but put you in mind of the birds and the bees. And where does that lead all too often? To those three little words. Darling, I'm pregnant. Now, how you greet those words with joy or with a little discomfort is entirely down to your own personal circumstance. But one thing I can tell you for certain, you can wave goodbye to your little two-seater sports car or any hope of ever owning one. Welcome, my friend, to the world of the MPV.
Clamber on board, and straight away, Ford have very much shunned the kind of fun French flavour you find in a lot of other MPVs, where they carpet the dash and then put the console in the centre. It's very, very sensible and sober in here, it's wearing a suit. But I would worry, if it were mine, that it might date rather quickly, particularly with this bit of walnut along here, and it's all rather sober and boring. But that is probably a nod from Ford towards the many business buyers for the Galaxy. Oh, and I forgot to mention, you're going to have to start doing things like buying a diesel. Well, no, you don't have to have the diesel. It just so happens that I've hopped into the 1.9 litre TDI, which is the diesel of the Rage, and very good it is too. Very strong with loads of low range torque, as you'd expect. But you can have either of the two petrols, a 2.3 litre or a 2.8 litre V6. And if that engine is anything like as good in this one as it was in the old Galaxy, it should be quite a fiery little number for a big old bus. And here's the interesting bit. Because in each of those versions, even in this, the TDI, you can have a six-speed gearbox. That's usually something you'd find in your little sports car, so perhaps it's something to keep you happy in. Once you're in here, you can kit on your in your little sports car. Might be a surprise in a diesel, but actually quite useful, because it does mean you can row it through the gears and keep it in that narrow power band. And in the petrol, obviously, there are advantages, because you can optimise the engine's efficiency and get maximum fuel economy. And believe me, all of a sudden, you're going to start thinking about things like fuel economy. MPV unless you have to, and if I really had to, well I think I'd probably want something with a little more flair and innovation. But then trying to make an MPV exciting is rather like buying wellies to match your dinner suit. Pointless. And that's very much the message that they got when they put the car in front of a consumer clinic. They said they wanted conservative, they said they wanted nothing too striking and frightening, nothing too radical and no big changes. So that's exactly what they got. In case of if it ain't broke, don't fix it. And that's it. It's been top of the pops for a long time and it'll probably continue being top of the pops. Nothing to change there. Don't expect it to be exciting, that's all. You're not going to have the thread of a lifetime. You've already had that. That's why you need an MPV. Hype is a very dangerous thing. To hype a car up to a car buying public that includes the RS Owners Club that are prepared to believe every single word is playing with fire. After not months, but years, the Focus RS finally arrived at the tail end of last year, and it was one of the most eagerly anticipated car launches of recent times. The entire male population of Essex was on Valium. Fingernails were bitten down to flesh, and Ford, well, they just lit the bright blue touch paper, crossed their fingers, and stood back. So, what was the verdict? The car is said to be inspired, of course, by the Focus RS of the World Rally Championships, but, well, it's a funny word, that, inspired. I might be inspired by rude Van Nistelrooy, but trying to play football like him is another matter. I play football like Dick Van Dyke. From the outside, the RS is truly stunning and has more than a passing resemblance to its world-conquering, all-terrain-munching cousin. The stance is much more squat than the standard car and it has bite-your-legs-off styling all round. And the components too are made by the same people as on the WRC car. The wheels are made by Oz, the brakes by Brembo, the seats by Sparco, etc, etc. So how good is it? Was it worth the wait? Was the hype justified? And just how inspired by the WRC car is it? Do you know, I've just had a thought. That last bit about just how inspired is this car by the WRC vehicle, well, I can't answer that because I've never driven one. But the rest, I'll give it a go. When Ford put the incredible Escort Cosworth out to stud all of those years ago, they did promise us a 300 horsepower four-wheel drive replacement. Well, someone had their fingers crossed because what they've delivered is a front-wheel drive 212 brake horsepower car. And they made us wait a very long time. But they may have delivered late, but boy have they delivered. Firstly, there's the engine, a super-sounding two-litre four-cylinder turbocharged unit that doesn't sound dissimilar to its esteemed cousin, the Escort Cosworth. It will really sing for you up in the high revs. It's not quite as stunning as the incredible VTEX from Honda, but musical and inspiring nonetheless. The overriding joy of this engine definitely resides in the mid-range. 
down at the bottom there is significant turbo lag and at the top end it doesn't feel too comfy either but in the mid range between three and a half and six thousand revs and with the clever use of the throttle and the brilliant five speed gearbox you get a huge amount of torque enough to last Parky a lifetime of shows now there was controversy to say the least when Ford announced that the RS was going to be driven only from the front. The car was supposed to challenge the Audi S4s, Evos and Impreza's of this world, all of which have four feet to run with, but Ford have simply said it doesn't need it. Well they would say that wouldn't they? Now reading between the lines on the four wheel drive issue, it seems that there was huge problems getting power to the rear of the car that involved a lot more design and a lot more cost which is why Ford say they don't need it. But all of those other cars that we mentioned, the Audi S4, the Impreza and the Evo, all have four wheel drive, so you pays your money, you takes your choice. And to a degree, it doesn't need four wheel drive because on a nice smooth surface, the RS has an incredible amount of grip. There's also a noticeable absence of wheel spin despite the absence of traction control, although put your foot down hard over some crests and there's a disappointing amount of torque steer, which would be eliminated if there were four wheels powering it. But that's being picky, considering the power onslaught going through to the front, the car performs brilliantly. But get the car on anything other than a nice smooth A road, and you start to notice where the focus is, well, not a letdown, but let's just say irritating, that's a polite way of saying it, because hit a pothole or a minor bump at speed and the car will deviate and you have to go routes that you wouldn't have thought possible, let alone planned. The car has got a mind of its own at speed and you need to keep both hands firmly on the steering wheel when you're driving at speed. But this car is all about performance and handling. That two litre four cylinder engine might not sound like much, but with that huge turbocharger, it generates 212 brake horsepower, enough to get this little car from 0 to 60 in under six seconds and onto a top speed of 144 miles per hour. So, was this car worth waiting for? Oh boy, yes. Was the hype justified? Well, probably. Although to keep mentioning this RS in the same breath as the WRC focus is to get just a little bit carried away. But boy and girl racers the world over, and especially in Essex, will love this car. And some boy racers like me that got older and fatter, they'll love it. In America, they just love them. No, I'm not talking about burgers, donuts or muffins. I'm talking about pickup trucks. Why Americans have this fascination with pickup trucks I really just can't understand to be honest. And you don't have to be a hillbilly redneck swilling bourbon to drive one. They've now become family vehicles with large cabs, luxury accommodation and in the case of something like the Dodge Ram, a seriously fast beast that can outdrag most sports cars. So it's interesting that Ford have decided to launch this the new Ranger here in the UK. Now apparently our lifestyles demand this sort of vehicle. It's going to be the next big trend. Does your lifestyle demand a pickup truck? No, and I'm not sure that mine does either. Perhaps it's more the case that Mitsubishi have the L200 introduced now in the UK and Toyota have the Hilux. But at the moment the pickup truck market here in Britain is only worth 0.13% of total vehicles sold. So in other words, the market share is tiny for this sort of vehicle. Unlike this rather big beast, which is big in every way, apart from what's under the bonnet. Now you get a choice of two two and a half litre diesel engines. The first kicks out only 78 brake horsepower and is an indirect injection diesel. This second one is better. It produces 109 brake horsepower it's turbocharged and intercooled, it's the same two and a half litre engine. But let's face it, neither engine is going to produce really any sort of excitement. And you can imagine both of them struggling up a fairly large hill with a full payload and a trailer on the back. So how does the Ranger cope out on the road? Well, you have to start by saying it's slow. It's unbelievably slow, in fact. I know 0 to 60 figure times don't really count for this sort of vehicle, but just to give you an example and to prove the point, 
I'll tell you anyway. The 60 mile per hour sprint in this 2.5 turbo diesel takes a snail's pace 26 seconds. But that's nothing compared to the non-turbo diesel engine, which would take you to 60 miles per hour in an astonishing 43 seconds. You could run faster for goodness sake. It's amazing that in America, pickup trucks have wonderful, huge engines, superb acceleration. Here, they're tinny, they're hopeless, they're slow. There are three versions of the Ranger, a regular cab with seating for two and either two or four wheel drive, a super cab with two extra jump seats and two wheel drive, and this, the four door double cab, the family version if you like. It seats five, it has four wheel drive, and the turbocharged engine plus lots of payload space. Ride-wise in the Ranger, well, the suspension is very, very soft, which you really notice at most on country lanes on the motorway. It's fine. At steering, little light, a little vague, a lot of understeer. You go towards a corner, you start to turn, and nothing much seems to happen, so you turn and turn again until you get round. Acceleration through the gears, first and second, nothing much to talk about, but once you get into third and fourth gears, there's plenty of torque there and it's very happy cruising on the motorway at 70 or so miles an hour with still plenty to get you past slower traffic. Inside the cabin it's really quite spacious, certainly thanks to this high roof line. Ford claim you can also seat five adults in comfort in this double cab version. Now looking at those rear seats, I somehow doubt that, but anyway, that's what they claim. Specification is pretty high, the steering wheel is tilt and height adjustable, you get a radio cassette play, you get twin sun visors no less, which obviously is a big selling point on pickup trucks. Other things in this double cab version you get as well, electric windows and air conditioning, bless them. Now, although Ford claim that this is the sort of vehicle that can be used to enhance our lifestyle, I can't honestly see it, can you? If you're a builder, a tradesman, something like that, you need that payload capacity at the back, absolutely fine. For the rest of us, just doesn't work for me, and certainly Mitsubishi's L200 looks better. Prices, well, they start at about £10,500 for the caffeine-free regular cab version, rising to about £15,000 for this caffeine-enhanced double cab version. Now on this week's programme we're looking for a new car for our viewer Simon Holmes who's 25, he's in the media industry and he currently drives a Ford Puma. He's already driven the Nissan 200SX but what else have we got for him on this week's programme? Well we've also got a Ford Cougar and here's Richard Hammond with a lowdown on the Cougar. Oh dear. Remember when you were a kid and you used to build an oil rig out of cereal packets and loo roll tubes? Well mine looked exactly like this only it was built slightly better and probably looks slightly better even now. But you were worried about your speaker space. <laughs> Look at this boot in a coupe. You'd get stadium kit in there. But hold on, if we're going to start judging a coupe according to boot space and rear seat accommodation, there's something wrong buying a state car. And here's a worrying point it's got a tow ball on a coupe. Isn't that a bit like buying a scooter with bull bars or trying to fit a roof rack to a soft top? The thing about the Cougar to me is, looking at it, do you not get the impression that somebody somewhere in Ford was trying just a little bit too hard to please their boss when they designed it? I mean, look, yeah, nice one, Dave. Now make me one that looks pretty. This ridiculous idiot grin. Does anybody really want a sports car that when you open the garage door is there? <laughs> I go fast, me. Nasty. And it seems like the world would agree because last year Ford sold one. And if that was you, <laughs> it's so bad they've killed it off completely. And frankly, I agree with them. I'm sorry, Cougar, you were never any good. Good riddance. Well, Simon, I guess you already like Ford cars because you've got the Puma at the moment. I mean, how different do you think this Cougar is? Just, you know, driving it around the corner, you can feel the mass moving from side to side. And the long wheelbase, of course, means it isn't as nimble, but it's, you know, it still feels good on the road. It's got a nice 2.5 V6 engine, it's 170 brake horsepower, so it's a pretty quick car, isn't it? Now, this car's only done 14,000 miles. Um, it is the 2.5 V6, so it's the top of the range, and there's only two cars in the Cougar range anyway, the 2.0-litre and this 2.5. I certainly won't get from the 2.0-litre, that's no. for sure, because it's just mm. too underpowered. But, I mean, when you think that this car was somewhere around 22 grand when it was new, yeah. 
I'm not so sure I'd want to spend that sort of money on this, would you? Well, with the Celta car, you do suffer depreciation, and somebody's lost, what, Big 11 time. grand? Big time. Uh, in 14,000 miles of motoring, which is just obscene. Um, you know, most people wouldn't spend that much on the car in the Absolutely, first place, yeah. and then mind just lose it. So, somebody, like myself, is in a good position to buy a new car with leather, it's got electric it's adjustable got seats, it, it? Yeah, yeah, aircon, yeah. power steering, traction control, you know, it's a nice looking car. So you can really, well, show off a bit really. For 11 grand. Yeah, for 11 grand. good value for money.